Hey, what up? It's Brad with Home Love Construction, and welcome to another episode of the Critical Path Podcast. I'm here with a very special guest, Jason Lambert. Jason uh, is my construction attorney. Now, before we get into this episode, which is going to be super interesting, and I think it's going to be one of the most uh, valuable 45 minutes that a contractor could spend, because especially if you work in the state of Florida, I do want to say this is not legal advice. Hire a great construction attorney, get your advice from them. We're just going to talk about some general stuff. We're not talking about any specific legal situations. Now, that said, Jason, why don't you introduce yourself and say who you are and what you do? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Jason Lambert. As you said, I'm a board certified construction attorney in Florida. Uh, I've been practicing for about 12 years, and I almost exclusively represent contractors and subcontractors in almost anything that relates to their business. Um, and before that, I spent about a decade in the construction industry, mm -hmm. both uh, in the electrical supply business and then as a project manager for large custom and uh, light commercial projects. So I've yeah. been on that side of it, uh, went to law school, and now I'm on the other side of it uh, representing uh, folks like you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's been it's been really good. Before we were uh, before we started, we were, we were talking. And one thing that I mentioned is how in one of our first conversations ever, uh, you mentioned to me how construction is actually, you said the second most regulated industry in the state of Florida. Can you talk about that for a second? And Yeah, absolutely. It is. The only uh, profession that's more heavily regulated than contractors in Florida is the medical profession. Crazy. Um, if you look at the number of statutes, the number of regulations, uh, you know, and then you add on to that the building codes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, there's more regulations that affect contractors than almost any other licensed profession. And that includes engineering. It includes architecture, um, anything. Yeah. And I think a lot of contractors in Florida don't realize that. I, I don't think homeowners or property owners realize that either. Wow. Um, there's a whole <laughs> lot of regulations that go into, you know, bringing something up out of the ground and making it yeah. a livable or, or inhabitable structure. Yeah. Um, and I also think that, uh, one reason contractors should know that is not just to know that there's a bunch of rules they need to comply with, but you're a highly regulated licensed professional. You should act like it and you should expect to be treated like it too. Yeah. Um, and so and I think And you should that's, charge like it. And you should charge like it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, really? So th that's, I think that's a critical thing for contractors. And I think that's why that's one of the most important pieces I try to tell clients when we meet and talk is, hey, understand that you're regulated. And that's not just so you are aware of all these rules. It's so that you act accordingly. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. The, the thing that kind of like was eye opening for me is, um, when, when we first started sitting down, we kind of like went through our contract and you're like, well, well, first off, there's these four disclosures that did you know you had to have these in there? And I was like, shit, no. And that is like, there, there were a bunch of like super like quick little things because you've been doing it for a while that you knew like, Hey, he's probably missing X, Y, and Z had a couple of them were was missing a bunch of them. And with, with most, like most contractors that I interact with, they're probably largely trying to run their business at like a, a 20%, right? Whatever, whatever their cost is, add 20% to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're going to run off of. And what I've, and we tried actually doing our business that way for, for a long time. And what we found is that literally you cannot afford good legal representation at that level. And it's, it's it's actually way more important than contractors realize to have a really good legal representation for, for and I found for two reasons. One is that you can speak intelligently to your intelligent clients. Most contractors I found contract with people who are at a very high income level. Those are usually sophisticated people. And so if you don't have sophisticated, like basically like a legal team, I mean, now we have like a legal team we're building up with you, Jeff, other people mm -hmm. from, from your firm. Like if you can't afford that, then you're not, you're literally, your growth is going to be capped. You know what I mean? Like I, I literally like tell people this now after having experienced it, do you, do you think that like, uh, of, I would assume the answer is yes, but do you think that having a, a great construction attorney is a critical early piece to a good construction company? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's really important. Uh, and I, I think there's two reasons to it. One, as you're growing your business, I mean, you're, you're, going into people's homes and doing work. If you're remodeling or you're building something new, you're doing things that are going to impact their life and their business. And anytime you're doing that, there's risk. Mm -hmm. And so as you're growing, unless you're just incredibly lucky, 
you're going to encounter problems that chip away at your profitability or your yeah. success on these projects. Either either it's a delay that you know costs you time on another project, or it's something that increases your cost that mm -hmm. you can't then recover because it was a mistake or there was some other sort of issue, or you're just eating some minor amount of money because you don't want to have the fight over it. Yeah. Um, and so if you can avoid those, the more of those that you can avoid, the better off you're going to be and the easier it's going to be for your company to grow. And yeah. one of the ways to do that is eliminate the easy, you know, the, the easy problems for somebody else to find. So making yeah. sure your contract has good language in it and includes all the right statutory disclosures. Make sure you're properly licensed for the work that you're doing and that you're hiring licensed subcontractors. Make sure yeah. you have a good subcontractor agreement. Like, put pieces in place that yeah. let you deflect some of that risk. There's going mm -hmm. to be risk no matter what when you're when you're engaged in this type of you're work. You're in business, yeah. Yeah, but if you can mitigate that and reduce it and do that early, mm -hmm. you know, early in your business, get a, a good contract, <sighs> Yeah, then you're going to be much better off down the road. And you can tweak and improve and expand that as you grow, but if you start off in a good position, you're going to be much better off down the road. And you're going to yeah. get to whatever your goals are from a success standpoint, you're going to get there much faster. Yeah. Whenever I've had like for, I think we've, I, I've been working with you probably a year and a half now, maybe ish rough time. That, yeah. And one, one thing is we, we made a lot of like, like some minor at the time, it seemed minor tweaks to our contract when we first started working together. And now I'm running into situations where I'm like, wow, I'm so glad that I did that a year and a half ago and I didn't wait six months to do it. Cause if I had waited six months, this contract that I'm now having like an issue with, or there's a, a confusion or something on the client, I need to bring them back to the contract and show them. If I hadn't made that tweak right then when you recommended it, I wouldn't actually be protected from certain situations. So yeah, it's like when you talk about early, that kind of is the name of the game. Cause a construction contract doesn't usually like hit you like a, it's like a problem. It doesn't hit you in the beginning of the, of the project. It hits you six, eight, 10 months later at the right. end of right. the project. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you were going to say something. Well, well I was going to say the other, the other thing that I think is important while we're talking about contracts is not only to make sure that you're hitting these, these sort of legal requirements, but also make sure that you're doing them in such a way that they match the way you do business. Yes. Talk about this. If yeah, this is great. Yeah. So if, if you, you know, use, let's say you use builder trend and that's mm -hmm. how you manage all your projects and you're managing your change orders that way. And everything goes through there. We do not sponsored by builder trend open to it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> as you should be. Uh, but don't, uh, don't have language in your, um, in your contract then that says that change orders are going to be handled in a, in a way using like a written triplicate form or something else, Yeah, you know, make sure. And that sounds like a really simple example, but make sure that it matches the way you do things. And a lot of contractors, maybe when they're starting out, will, you know, they'll download a contract off the internet or they'll get one from a friend or they'll, mm -hmm. you know, cobble together some pieces from other places they've worked. And that all sounds well and good unless none of it matches the way they actually do business. And one of the problems you can run into is you get to the end of the project and it's, well, no, no, this was supposed to be a change order or this was not something we're responsible for. And the other side says, well, yeah, but you never we never had a signed change order or we never agreed to that the way mm -hmm. the contract says we're supposed to agree mm -hmm. to it. And the reality is your business was never set up to do what the contract said anyway. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the other side of it is make sure it's legally compliant, but also just make sure that it matches the way your business runs. Yeah. Um, it'll save you a lot of heartache down the road. You expressed that to me very uh, poignantly at one meeting that we had. And you said, Brad, don't write your contract aspirationally. Yes. I remember you. I remember yeah, that exact absolutely. word you use, and I was like, "Wow, that totally communicates." Yeah, because I've done that where I'm like, "Oh, we should do, we should handle all our change orders in in this way, not a triplicate form, but like something like something sure. like that." And then I'm like, "Wait a minute, if we mess that up one time, then our change order isn't necessarily binding, and if it's not paid right then, then we're gonna have a problem collecting on it later on the project." I'm like, "Wow, that's that's fantastic advice." Yeah, and and it can impact your ability to collect on it, it can impact your ability to include it in a construction lien. And, and change orders are just sort of a classic example of where problems yeah. come up. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's, but I mean, it, it change out change order with almost any other aspect of the construction process. And if you're not yeah. handling it appropriately, you know, as your contract says you should, mm -hmm. that's always going to cause problems for you down the road. Yeah. 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 And, and sometimes um, like, like I've even experienced, so this, this would actually be my advice for construction company owners is your employees will sometimes suggest to you 
things that should be added to your contract to try to solve problems, which is great. Obviously, you want employees who are bringing you solutions. You want to get your whoever your your legal consultant is, like your attorney, to actually review that before you put it in, because you may be you may actually fall, be falling into that trap of hey, your employee is thinking aspirationally as a business owner. You're like, hey, what's the bottom line thing I can do here to keep myself out of trouble, not create situations? Employees don't always have the the whole picture. I know because I've literally had to say no to a lot of suggestions like this. Where I'm like, that's aspirational. It's not going in the contract. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Well, it's like we'll say they'll they'll always be shown this document before we start the project. And I'm like, have we done it 100 percent of the time without fail? Well, no, but we could. Okay, then it's not going in the contract. Right. Like literally, that's that's the rule. Have we done it 100 percent? Are we forced to do this? Like, can it will it always happen? If not, yes, it doesn't go in the contract. Right. Like as far as our obligations, right? Obviously we always have to deliver the project. Like hundred percent of the time we do that. Right. So that goes in. Right. But yeah. No, it's great. Just making sure that the process is matched up with it. That's, that's yeah. super important. Yeah. Um, and, and really a best practice for any company. Totally. So let's, can we switch to liens? Cause yes. I, I really want to talk to you about liens. Yes. So what, if you had to start somewhere with, with liens, and obviously this this is in Florida. We, we're operating in the Tampa Bay area in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. What's the first thing that a, a construction company owner needs to know about liens in Florida from your viewpoint? Um, the, the first thing is to know who you're doing business with. So if yeah. you're a contractor and you're doing business with the property owner, then you have a lien right yeah. um, for the work that you actually perform out there and you don't have to serve a notice to owner. Yep. You just have a lien. Now, I'll, the two sort of pitfalls that I commonly see that relate to this are, one, the contractor enters into a contract with somebody who's telling them they're the property owner, and it turns out they're not. Dude. It's owned by yes. a trust. It's owned oh by an God. LLC. Yeah. So take in Florida, you almost everything's a public record. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. happened to everybody. Uh, all ownership records are all public records. So yeah. take 30 seconds, look up who the actual owner of the property is, and have that be who your contract is with. And yeah. if you can't, for whatever reason, you know, again, if it's a, a trust and you're signing with the trustees or it's an LLC and you're signing with somebody else, um, you know, then make a mental note. Okay, I need to serve a notice to owner just to be safe. Yeah. There are a lot of arguments for why you might still have a lien right anyway, even without mm -hmm. serving a notice to owner. But mm -hmm. you can either take, again, five minutes, send the notice and know that you're going to be covered no matter what. Or make me have to make that argument later on. Yeah, which is fine. The second I like option arguing, is a lot more expensive. But it's second option is yeah. a lot more expensive, yeah. and uh, you know, just creates another hurdle, yeah. another technical hurdle to getting you paid or getting the project completed, which yeah. you don't want to. And you know what's funny is like the the expensive. I actually find that usually when like when you get involved in something, usually actually resolves very fast. So it's actually, if you look at it as a business owner, I, I actually have, am trying to just like stop saying that as like it's more expensive because obviously we want to handle it up front. But the thing that's more expensive than having your attorney handle something is the the mental like capacity that you lose worrying about oh, an issue. Sure. You know, for me, that's the biggest expense I can have. So if I can pay whatever the the attorney's rate is to not have that, I'm like, actually, that's cheaper. You know what I mean? So so I'm I'm like kind of grooving that into myself of like, don't try to handle everything yourself. Let your team handle it. Like let the professionals handle it. You know what I mean? And sure. the other thing is you obviously have to make sure that you're working with professionals. Like there's different levels of acuity. I mean, we've, we've had situations where we get some sort of letter from a homeowner that's written by their friend. Who's an attorney who knows nothing about they're out of state. Right. And it's like, you're, you're just like, okay, let me just explain a couple things to them. And it just goes away because they literally don't even realize what they're talking about. So I'm getting a little off track here, but just want to say that yeah. on, on liens, um, you actually did a study and like you basically went and did some research on litigation of liens, right? Yes. What did you find? So I, I looked back, I was trying to figure out how valuable a construction lien actually is to a yep. contractor. Um, and so I actually, I went back through my own cases. This was a couple of years ago. I did which, this. which the, the, the basically like if you have a lien, that's, that's, worth a hundred thousand dollars how often are you going to collect all 100k is exactly. that what you're looking at okay. yeah that's Good. basically what i was looking at and so I, I went back through you know probably 20 or 25 different construction liens that that i had recorded for clients and that we litigated or you know resolved one way or the other and sure. you know the the way that a lien 
is most valuable to a contractor is if the property owner is ultimately trying to, you know, either sell the property yep. or refinance or do mm -hmm. something else that requires clear title clear of the title. property yep. because that always brings everybody back to the table. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, the if you've got to lean on somebody's home and they've lived there for 20 years and they're going to live there for another 20 years uh, and they're just trying to pay off their mortgage, there's nothing else they're going to do there's not a lot of incentive on them to actually deal with the lien. So that means you as the contractor have to take action to foreclose it. And in Florida, construction yeah. liens are only valid for a year. That timeline can be shortened. It cannot be extended though. So yeah. if it, if you don't do it within that year, so, you lose so it. listen to what he said, a one year cannot be extended, can be shortened. It yes. can actually be brought down to 60 days. Yeah. Oh, it can, I mean, it can be brought down to 20 days. If oh, the be homeowner less? Oh, wants wow. to sue you to, to force you oh, to enforce your got lien, it. Got it, got um, it. it can be brought that short, but wow. the, the point of all of that is to understand at that point in time, you're taking, you have to expend money and time and energy yep. to pursue it. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, I found that most contractors, when you factored in attorney's fees, interest, the principal amount of the lien, yeah. they would recover anywhere from 75 to 90% of what their total spend was. So if it was a $100,000 lien, yeah. they spend $20,000 on legal. Yeah. And let's say they were entitled to you know $15,000 in interest over mm -hmm. the course of that litigation. Mm -hmm. They're only recovering 75 to 90% of that total um, through Got the course it. of it, which is better than zero. Yeah. But it's also you're spending money to recover not the full amount in a lot of instances. Yeah. Um, and, and there are exceptions to that I've had two cases in the last six months where the client got paid everything, um, which is fantastic. Wow. But, um, that's, you know, I would say that's probably 20% of the time that's yeah. going to happen. The rest of the time, for a lot of reasons, you're probably settling for something less. And yeah. then the other, the other issue, once it comes to construction liens is Construction liens in Florida are governed by statute. It's a very mm -hmm. technical statute. There are a lot of requirements, Dude. not only with the lien itself, but what has to happen before it, what has to happen after it, mm -hmm. things that have to happen before you can file a lawsuit to enforce the lien. And if you make a mistake somewhere or, you know, miss something or you didn't think something was this way, but it actually is, or mm -hmm. there's another issue, um, it can absolutely crater your lien. And so yeah. I've had over the, over that 20 something lien period that I was looking at, uh, there were a couple of them where the clients ultimately just got nothing because yeah. there was a there was a flaw in something that usually they did on the front end yep. that affected their lien rights later. Front end meaning contract wise, it, or either not contract wise, or or, or not doing a notice to owner, yeah. or something that went happened on the project, mm -hmm. um, things like that. I mean, there are the most important parts of a construction lien that you need to get right. I mean, the form is a statutory form, so yeah. it's hard to screw that up. Yeah. Um, by the way don't use like a form from somewhere else. Just go yeah, find yeah. the form. Or, yeah, literally or have just get it from the do state. It. Yeah. yeah, don't don't find some other made up form. But yeah. the dollar amounts that go on it and the dates that go on it are probably the two most critical things. And right. so spend time to make sure those are accurate. Mm -hmm. Because again, you can, if, if you don't have a lien, you know, you lose your lien right for whatever reason or you don't record it timely or there's an issue, you can still sue somebody for breach of contract. Yeah. You can still recover your the money that you're owed. Right. You just don't have the property as security. Yeah. And, and while that's great to have the property as security, again, most people aren't going to let their home get sold over mm -hmm. whatever the amount of your lien is. Well, and, so, and the bank definitely won't. It, it, like well, from, from what I understand is if you actually get a sure. judgment on a lien, then it becomes a whole conversation of does, does the bank just pay it like the, the the person who's holding the mortgage, well, right? not it depends on yeah. on when and how that mortgage came into effect. So if the if, mm. again, if you're talking about like a remodeling project, yeah, you have a part person who's owned the property for a while. They have a first mortgage on the property. Yeah, you then start work, record your notice of commencement. You ultimately record a construction lien and go to foreclose it. Yeah, that first party mortgage holder may never care, even if you foreclose it and get the property because you're taking it subject to their mortgage. So even oh, if you foreclose on this property it. and get it, yeah, you still have a mortgage that's north of you that you've got to either got it deal with yeah. or try to sell the property another way to satisfy that mortgage and satisfy your judgment and all of that. Wow. So, so the bank will just sit there and just let it happen, basically. Like, yeah, because again, they're in the first they position. Still have, they have a better right to you wow. for the property anyway. Wow. So yeah, my, huh. my experience has generally been that they don't get involved. Um I, I don't think there's any reason they couldn't, but my experience sure. has been that they don't. Wow. That mm -hmm. is totally contrary to everything I've ever been told. 
Yeah. But I, I, when you're explaining, I'm like, that totally makes sense. Yeah, why would they even spend the money to do anything on it? Yeah, they don't care. As long as they're getting payments, they, <laughs> they truthfully don't care. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, notwithstanding, I'm sure there's language in their mortgage yeah. that says if there's a lien, they can take certain actions. But right. m- my experience has been that they don't. Yeah, so when when dealing with, um, like when dealing with a homeowner who, say, doesn't want to make their last payment or something like that, which, which by the way, just to put it uh, on record here for any of my clients who are watching, like 99.9% of clients pay on time, right when asked, no problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, in my experience, I've found that most of them are very happy to pay. They're very happy to honor their contract and very few problems with collecting payment. In my experience, other contractors may find it differently. What do you find is actually the best practical use of a lien for a contractor? Like how, you get what I'm saying? Like how do, how best can they utilize that tool you know, is, is it, I guess the question is, is it better as, as a, as kind of a, a threat to kind of just be like, Hey, there can be a lien that's coming if you don't pay, you, you know what I mean? Like, sure. when do you see it the most effective? I, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's, it can certainly be effective as a threat. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's probably most effective. Um, it, if, for example, the homeowner does have a lender who's funding construction, Typically, yeah. a lien will shut down further payments, right? Um, yeah. which can cause issues for them as well. So that mm-hmm. gives you some leverage there. Um, I think they are effective anytime you've run into a problem on the on the project in terms of making sure that you have the ability to get paid down the road. Yeah. And I don't, I don't mean that just in the sense of they've said, hey, we're not going to pay you this last payment, or there's yeah. some fight over the quality of the workmanship or something like that. Mm-hmm. I, I go back to like, Imagine the homeowner gets hit by a bus in the middle of the project. Right. You know, maybe they have a will, maybe they don't. Maybe the property goes through probate. I've yeah. had, in the last year, I've had two clients that in the middle or at the end of projects, the property owner passed away. Wow. And so we we recorded a lien. Yeah. And you just sit there and sort of wait for what's going to happen. And ultimately, it works through its process and they got paid. But oh, that's great. if they hadn't yeah. recorded a lien... As they're as the property is going through probate, or as the family is dealing with the will, it doesn't I don't necessarily think, get satisfied. I don't think yeah. anybody would have even known necessarily that the work. Like in one yeah. case, it was a roof, and it was completed. Yeah. Like I don't know that anybody else who got involved after the fact knew that this work had been done. Wow. And in the absence of a lien, nobody would have known that my client was owed any amount of money. Wow. So I, I think there's any time you sense that there's going to be an issue with the project, either because the property owner is saying, you know, we don't have the money or we're not going to pay you or yeah. something bad happens. Yeah. I think you can use the lien as a tool to protect your, to protect yourself yeah. and to protect that ability to get paid and sort of to provide notice out there. Yeah. So. The notice to that totally makes sense to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and we, we found that in instances where, like you said, there's a lender or there's some sort of funding source for the renovation itself, highly effective. And Very. just the word lean is just boom, handled. Like just, it it really does kind of cut through. And a lot of times a homeowner will come with like, okay, here's my bottom line. Here's what I need handled. And it kind of blows off a lot of the extra added unnecessary back and forth type sure. stuff. Sure, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So in terms of, I, I want to shift to to money and, and handling of funds a, a little bit. We, sure. we, we won't, there's so much that you can talk about here and so much opinion and what, I don't want to necessarily go on the like misappropriation of funds side because that's okay. just a freaking black hole that I think no contractor wants to look at. No, you don't um, want to stay away from that. Yeah, but but what we should talk about is uh, the like in terms of money. Um, should I actually kind of lost my train of thought here? So, da da da. Well, what's I have a question for you though. Yeah, you've been, you've been asking me questions. So yeah, yeah. The in terms when we're talking about the financial side of things. Yeah. You know, are you structuring agreements in such a way that you're you're mapping out draws and mapping out the way money is supposed to be paid as it relates to how those expenses are going to be paid, or are you just sort of pegging it to milestones with kind of a not a guess, but like an yeah. idea of. You know, uh, if we can do it at these milestones, we should be ahead of things. Or are you really tightly yeah. sort of we're tying it to things? Yes, great question. Thank you. It's the best question I've ever been asked on the show. So uh, what what we do is we just operate on the principle of we do a person's project with their money, right? There is some fiduciary responsibility that you give to a contractor. So we are, I basically have it set up so that our draw schedule keeps us ahead 
of what we what our expenses are going to be at all times as long as we're paid current. Obviously, if we go past the milestone and we peg it to uh, actual milestones on the project. So we we don't take more than 10% down. Life hack for Florida contractors, don't take more than 10%. I said it, not him. Um, please just do, do yourself a favor. Don't take more than 10% on a contract. Uh, we take another 30 when, when the, uh, permit is submitted, right? Mm-hmm. Cause then that handles, there's a timeline thing there. Sure. Uh, I think we do like, and then, and then it's like three fifteens and a 10, if that works out to 60, something like that, three fifteens, two tens, something like that. But then it's like, uh, the next milestone is like pass first inspection, first above ground MEP roughed in, uh, drywall ready for paint. So installed texture, to, texture's good, all that. And then we do flooring installed or cabinets delivered. And we then we do a, a final payment upon, we, we do it on substantial completion. We do have an allowance in our contract that allows them to hold back because we do line items. We can say, hey, whatever's not completed per the budget, uh, per the line items, you can hold that amount back from the final payment. And that, you know, that's due upon completion of their one written punch list. They get to submit one written punch list. Mm-hmm. Once that those items are complete, or owe the final payment, it then goes into, it'd be a warranty issue if there's something wrong after that point. Yeah, and I, th- I think that's a really good approach yeah. um, because the one, by pegging how, pegging completion in the final payment to the punch list and these dollar amount items, mm-hmm. you help eliminate that fight at the end over, you know, where you're holding back 10 grand for a $500 punch list item. Like yeah. what's the, you know, wh- where's the justification for that? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one thing I always recommend my clients is, address how that end of project process is supposed to go and what each side's responsibilities are and what each side is allowed to do to sort of, you know, dangle the carrot in front of the other side to make sure they do what they're supposed to do. And if you spell that out and you, and you follow it, it, it becomes very easy to say, Hey, you're not following this property owner and you need to do that. Otherwise we're not going to come back out and, and complete these punch list items or do the things we need to do. Yeah. Um, And so that's, anywhere this just to tie it back into the contract discussion earlier anywhere you see sort of those pain points or those pressure points that's where you should put more detail into your contract yeah if, you know nobody wants to slide a 75 page contract across the table for a hundred thousand dollar residential construction project but <laughs> I, mean, it, I don't think it's unreasonable to to yeah. have a, a five to ten page contract Absolutely. for that type of project yeah that hits the high notes where it needs to, but then covers in detail where some of these pressure points are going to be. Yeah. Um, that will eliminate a lot of headache down the road too. Yeah. Totally. So yeah, no, I think 100%. that's a really great idea. So uh, the, the, the thing that I wanted to bring up uh, just a second ago was, uh, paying your subcontractors. Mm-hmm. So when, when it comes to money, one thing that I tell my staff and, and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree, but I tell them that when it comes to money, like actual money in a bank account or cash, Possession is 99 one hundredths of the law. That's what I've observed. Now, I understand that you can litigate and blah, blah, blah. But like what I've observed is th- wh- once you give someone money for something, it's all like in, in construction from a business to business aspect is what I'm what I'm talking about here. Like paying your subcontractors. It is damn near impossible to get it back. From a practical perspective. It is from a practical standpoint. It's really hard to get it back. It's really expensive to get it back to. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, one, you want to make sure you have a subcontractor agreement that allows you to withhold funds yep. in certain circumstances. If you're using subs across multiple projects, make sure there's cross default provisions. Yep. So if you mess up over here, I can hold back money here, yep. things like that. Added that eight um, months ago. It's coming handy. <laughs> there you go. Good. Yeah. Um, so you want to make sure of that. The the problem where, where you start to run into problems with subcontractors is if you're not paying them and they start to put liens on properties because right. they... They have that same right as well. Totally. As long as they've sent out notices to owners, they can put construction liens on a project. And that obviously is going to, you know, make a property owner upset. Yeah. Now there's a lien. I paid you for this. Why didn't you pay this guy? Right. You know, what's going on? Right. So you want to make sure, again, across your contract documents that you deal with that scenario as best you can. Yeah. Um, and, and then there may be times where you have to bond off a lien or, or litigate with a subcontractor to resolve that issue. Yeah. And the, so the thing that, that we found, cause we've actually had several instances where a subcontractor isn't performing, they're paid, let's say their first payment of, of three, they, they misperform at maybe like they, they don't get to passing a rough in cause there's some, uh, like deficiency or something like that. And they're like, and they say, well, we're not going to come back to fix the deficiency until we're paid. And, but their, their payment terms is second payment due 
when rough in is passed. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, and this isn't requiring additional work outside of your scope. It's literally these connectors are the wrong type of connector. Come swap the connectors and you'll pass and we can pay you. And they refused to do that. They actually put a, a lien on, on a property and we did, um, what was the, you know what I'm talking about, where you do you force them to litigate the lien within a certain number of days or it expires? You can send a, a notice, a contest of lien. Contest of lien. They yeah. have to do it within 60 days or it expires. Right. Super helpful. So what, what I found is that for, for GCs, now this is not advice for GCs who are like actually going around and making their money by not paying their subs. Those exist. I, I'm oh, sure I know. you know. Yes. Those absolutely. actually exist. Yeah. Like there are literally people who get work done and then don't pay for it. And that is their business model. Mm -hmm. And that also, by the way, is often the low bidder. Just for any homeowners who are watching, the low bidder, if you're wondering how they can be that low, it's because they're not going to pay for the work. Right. Like, right. And they're going to keep they're going to keep changing out subcontractors. Right. Like if you've ever had a, a job where you had three different plumbers complete the three different phases of right. construction, yeah. that's what was happening. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so funny. <laughs> It, it even, yeah, anyways, that literally I had a situation you know about where literally I paid somebody and they didn't, they didn't do it. Anyways, it happens to all of us folks, <laughs> but the bottom line is, uh, when, it, when it comes to paying, paying subcontractors, if like we have sometimes, and it, it's very, uh, infrequent, but sometimes we have subcontractors who kind of try to use the lien as a way to actually get the homeowner to pressure you to pay them. And what, and one thing that I found is that, uh, generally subcontractors are not so good at doing notice to owners. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's uh, a thing that I always look at whenever my staff is like, Oh, there's a lien on the blah property. I'm like, okay, good. Did they file a notice to owner? Did we get a copy of it? Right. And if the answer is no and no, I'm like, well, great. Did you want to bring me that lien to me so we can use this toilet paper or what what should we do with that lien? Right, yeah, it's it's, it's invalid on its face. And uh, you know, the one thing that Now obviously anything can be litigated, but Well, yeah, it can, it, though it's very difficult. I mean, if if they go to an attorney and ask them to foreclose that lien and yeah. and it's an attorney who knows anything about construction, they're going to ask about the notice to owner and they're going to say, "Yeah, this really isn't a case that you can bring." Yeah. They could sue for breach of contract or something, but sure. they're really going to have a lien right. Yeah. The problem that sometimes you'll run into or that the homeowner may run into down the road is you know, that lien is still out there and so if they do go to say sell the property yeah. later, <clears throat> I have I have had clients that had liens that they said, "We're not going to foreclose it. They let it expire." And two years down the road, a, a title company reached out to them and said, hey, what's the payoff on this lien? Wow. And they gave them a payoff and got paid. So, wow. you know, I, you know, so the point being, ultimately, you want to make sure that gets resolved because <laughs> if the homeowner three years later is trying yeah. to sell their house, you don't want to get that phone call. Yeah. But, uh, but that's, you know, you're right. I mean, it is invalid. Yeah. Nobody, it shouldn't be out there. Nobody should foreclose it. But yeah. ideally, you want to try and get that cleaned up somehow. Totally. Do, yeah. Does the contest of lien actually clean that up? Or is it you just show the, the hey, the con con contest of lien, uh, it wasn't ever litigated. So boom, you file that and you clear title. Is that kind of how that works? Yeah, or? it's it's as a, the way the statute is written, it's as a matter of law. If they don't take action to foreclose the lien within that 60 day period, the lien becomes null and void as yeah. a matter of law. Yeah, so, yeah. makes sense. Yep. What, so one, one thing that I've, I've actually always wanted, maybe we've talked about this a little bit, but one thing I've always wanted to know is you're, you're a pretty positive guy. Like you tend to stay pretty upbeat and happy, mm -hmm. but you're also an attorney dealing with construction law. How do those three things go together? <laughs> um, one, I, I try to, I try to focus as much of my practice as I can on working with clients on the front end of things. Yeah. <laughs> excuse me, let's try to let's try to make sure you have a good contract to avoid problems. Make sure you're properly licensed and you're properly insured and have all that set up correctly yeah. to avoid problems. Um, that's that piece of it. The other side of it is I try not to fight unnecessarily about things yeah. um, on behalf of my clients. So, uh, you know, we've had conversations before, you know, I, I try to bring things back to a client in terms of, hey, here are the here are the legal arguments we can make. Here's the good things about what we're talking about for you. Here are the bad things, here are the problems you have. Let's use that to make the best business decision possible. Yeah. And I, I feel like if you're focusing on that, it makes it a lot easier to, to keep things upbeat because you're focusing on yeah. something that's going to be good for their business. Yeah. It may be taking a loss. It may yeah. be walking away from something, but in the grand scheme of things, when you evaluate the strengths and weakness of their case and you evaluate, you know, what they've done, 
or haven't done that's gotten them in that situation, let's use that to learn, to make changes to a contract, to make changes to an internal business process, and and use that to move forward and try to not spend as much time, you know, litigating mm-hmm. or fighting over over things. Because so right. much of the, again, if you're going to litigate something, if you're going to litigate a payment dispute, whether yeah. it's a thousand dollars or a million dollars, if it involves construction. You have the same statutes that apply to all of it. You have the same rules of civil procedure that apply to all of it. Mm-hmm. We're going to have discovery. We're going to have to probably get an expert to say that you did the work right because the other side is going to get an expert to say that your work is the worst work <laughs> you've ever seen. Uh, worst I've ever seen. Right. And those are, I mean, and and so those costs are going to be the same no matter the size of the dispute. Yeah. And so if you just get bogged down in that, then it'd be, I think it'd be really easy to, to have a very negative outlook on this. But yeah. If you focus it on, great, let's evaluate things a little bit up front and try to find a way out of this problem so that we're not having to spend a bunch of time in court, I think that's the best decision for everybody. It yeah. may be a terrible business decision for me, um, <laughs> but it's it tends to help out my clients. And, and yeah. so far, it, you know, it hasn't really hurt me or my firm yeah. that much at all either. Yeah, so. I, I, I don't think it, it's that way. Because like for you, for example, I mean, I, I don't know how many people who I refer to you actually end up reaching out to you, but I do probably at least on like a every other week basis. Like somebody asked me, Hey, do you have a great construction attorney? I'm like, I sure do like, boom. And by the way, if you're in, do you do work out of the Tampa Bay area? You do, right? All, yeah. The whole, the state, whole state. Yeah. I have a trial in Miami next week. So oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Driving or flying? Driving. Driving. Nice. So, yeah. That's a good drive. I like going over the alligator alley actually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're in the state of Florida, honestly, you should actually reach out to Jason. I mean, I, it's since we've brought him on as our as our attorney, things have definitely quieted down a lot on the legal side, which is really what you need as a business owner. You, you can't be spending your time, all your time. Like there's obviously there's going to be a little bit, little two and a half percent of it. Sure. You got to handle the legal piece and it has to be handled like very well and correctly. Otherwise that shit will just kick your ass. Like I'm sure you've seen it where it's people let it get out of hand and then it just kicks their ass at some point. Oh yeah. Yeah. And and even even relatively small problems can turn into big ones very quickly. Right. Yeah. And and again, I mean, there are companies that can absorb a hit of some level. Yeah. And there are companies that can't. They're yeah. just not built that way. They're not cash flowing that way. They're not mm-hmm. making enough money that way. And it doesn't it really doesn't take a lot sometimes to to tank a company. Yeah. Um, and then in the construction industry, that can affect your license. I mean, it's not as simple as, gee, if there's a problem, I'll just shut down this company and go open up a new company. Sure. There are a lot of problems with that, yeah. not only from a, you know, can you really avoid that liability? You probably yeah. can't. Yeah. But also from a licensing standpoint, you know, at a certain point in time, if that comes to light, that's going to impact all your licenses, not just mm-hmm. the license that was connected to that company. Mm-hmm. So um, those are all, I mean, all things that, that contractors and construction companies need to keep in mind is pay attention to those things on the front end so that you can avoid those types of problems on the back end. Yeah. The, the other thing that I hope, you know, kind of like is coming across here is it does like handling construction legal stuff doesn't have to be this big, bad, scary thing. Like there are many competent construction attorneys out there who can actually, who can handle something pretty straightforward and simply I mean, there's, there's but like how many construction people are, are in your firm alone, like great construction there's, attorneys? We have 10 construction attorneys in our firm alone. And yeah. if you look at like the, the Florida Bar's website, they have all types of different board certifications. You can click on the link for construction attorneys and find 500 constru- board certified construction attorneys yeah. throughout scattered throughout the state. So you can yeah. find one near you. And if they're board certified, it means you know, at least 40% of their practice is in construction. They've mm-hmm. been doing it for at least five years. Wow, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and so by that time, you've built up enough knowledge mm-hmm. that if somebody calls with a relatively, a relatively straightforward or simple question or problem, I can answer it or somebody else should be able to answer it and they can move on and yeah. hopefully avoid a problem. Yeah. Um. So it's not always a, you know, gee, we're, we have to gear up for this big fight for something. It may be nothing yeah. or it may be some simple fix. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Like we, uh, we, we actually got, we got a form that I had never seen before, like a month ago. Um, it was the one where it was like sw- sworn statement of account. Mm-hmm. Right. And literally it, it was like, 
I think you spent like 15 minutes explaining to me what to do. You sent me over a format and it was like, oh, respond with this. And so I filled out the data and then boom, like sent it off and it was done. Yeah. So it's it's literally, some things are just so simple, but you you, you need an expert who's seen them before. You know, the the other thing is, we, we actually have a policy in our company, which it, it sounds very like um, silly almost, but it, it is actually the policy we follow is don't do anything illegal. Like that is literally sure. our policy. Yeah. So if it's like, if something requires a permit, no matter how freaking stupid it is, mm -hmm. we pull a permit for it. Yeah. And it's like some, some client, we actually don't get some jobs because of that. And that's, that's the way it's gotta be if you're actually gonna grow a big company. Because if you if you're gonna grow a big company, you have to be able to uh, evidence, like literally just prove, uh, like irrefutably, that you're doing things the right way. Eventually, you're gonna get called the task on it, and if you right. haven't been, it's gonna come back and bite you. Well, you hear you hear like in sports, you know, people talk about we have to eliminate stupid mistakes, and that yeah. that's how you win games or how right. you advance. Yes, if you eliminate the stupid mistakes, eliminate the easy things as a contractor then yeah, you eliminate that. Because if, if you come to me as your construction attorney and you say, we executed this project perfectly, the work is done flawlessly, you know, we're owed, we it was a $100,000 contract and we're owed the final $15,000 on yeah. it. And I start looking to say, yeah, great. Like, what's the problem here? Oh, well, we didn't pull a permit. <laughs> well, okay, that's a big, <laughs> that could be yeah. a big problem. Now that's a fixable <clears throat> problem and you you may have to spend some money to do it and maybe we can work something out. Yeah. But you've given the other side a really easy way to dig their heels in on right. something and a really easy avenue for them to bring somebody else in to inspect the work, to pick mm -hmm. it apart. You know, how many times have you gone and looked at a project another contractor oh, did dude. and you can point out weekly a dozen things that they did wrong, right? Yeah. A I don't, I don't do ever, by the way, as a personal policy, I don't ever point out the flaws in someone else's work. I, I just, but yes, you're totally right. Yeah. Well, but yeah. And, and it's you're, easy. Yeah. You, they just bring you right in. Here you you're go. kind enough to not do that. Yeah. Anybody else who's coming behind another contractor yeah. to bid on their work totally. or something is going to say, oh, I never would have done it that way. Yeah, I know. So got to rip it out. Got to rip it all sometimes out. Sometimes you do. Actually, sometimes we do run into that. And it's like, got to go to square one here, but sure. Yeah. But that's the, I mean, you're, if you're leaving that opening for somebody, then that's, what's going to cause you problems. Yeah. And if you can avoid that, do the, do, don't do illegal things. Yeah. Like then, literally, then you should, you're eliminating a lot of the problems that can come up. Yeah. If it's, there are some times where it's just going to be a straight up fight. The property owner's unhappy with your work. You're unhappy with their, them not paying you. There's a dispute over when and how all of that should have gotten resolved. Fine. Yeah. That's a straight up fight. Both sides can have that. And you put it in the hands of a third party, a judge or a jury or an mm -hmm. arbitrator, mm -hmm. and they pick a winner or they split the baby. Yeah. But, you know, most disputes are not that. Most yeah. of them, one side or the other has this one thing that they are really hanging their hat on, mm -hmm. that's a legitimate problem. Yeah. And if you can avoid that as best you can, yeah. you're gonna, you have a much better chance of lasting in this industry a lot longer. Yeah, and and that, what you just said is kind of the key that I've seen in construction is the people who are able to stick, just stick in and just stay in business the longest, end up with the lion's share of the business. Sure. Because they have, they have a track record. Like every year we're in business, it gets easier to get more business. Mm -hmm. Because people are like, oh, yeah, I've been hearing about your company for half a decade now. Right. And, and it's just like that that is so uncommon in the construction industry, unfortunately, because somebody gets convinced by whoever not to pull a permit and then they or they're afraid of the paperwork or whatever. Right. And they don't pull a permit. And then, you know, the homeowner withholds the last thing and then it turns into a complaint and blah, blah, blah. DBPR gets involved and it becomes a whole right. issue. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, you're exactly right. So what do you, what do you think? What's, what's, uh, what are your future plans? Like what, this is kind of more, more personal now, like as, as a construction attorney, like what's, what are your future plans? Cause I know you're a, you're a very, um, you're very interested in helping. You're kind of like the lead. I mean, I don't, this isn't, this is more to build you up than put anyone else down. But as far as I know, you're kind of the lead guy as far as construction attorneys in nari it, locally sure right in the, in the tampa bay nari you're very active there you write a lot like i actually my first intro to you was um you wrote like a 90 page ebook on mm -hmm. florida construction law and the biggest yes. misconceptions very helpful by the way Thank um you. what's what is like the future hold for you I, I i would love to continue writing and doing that sort of stuff one of the yeah. one of the things that that got me into this profession and that fuels the way i practice 
um, is my own experiences in construction of, you know, dealing with property owners as a contractor, um, dealing with subcontractors, seeing what everybody experiencing firsthand going through those problems. And I, I was building during the, the boom of 04, 05. And I like to say, I rode, I rode that all the way to the top and then I rode it all the way back down to the bottom straight into (laughs) law school. So, um, so I've, I've seen that side of it and so many problems could be avoided if, if contractors just knew, knew how to run, either run their business appropriately or just run it in compliance with these different regulations or things like that. And that drives a lot of the the writing of trying to put to get trying to condense, yeah. you know, thousands of pages of regulations into 60 pages that a contractor can keep in their truck or, yeah. you know, writing the blog and updating, you know, having updates on a weekly or monthly basis of here's new court decisions that came out. Not yeah. necessarily because I think contractors need to memorize what these cases do, but read them, see exa- there are examples of what went right or wrong with another project mm-hmm. and what to do with them. And I think that that's invaluable. I, I think that in construction, you sort of had this idea of, you know, back in the day of, oh, you're going to, you know, get a job working for a more seasoned contractor and you're going to learn that way and you're going to come up. And the reality is those guys maybe didn't know what they were doing either. And yeah. maybe you learned the right way to do things, maybe you learned the wrong way to do things. So yeah. as much as I can provide those resources out there, that's what I'm going to do. And yeah. then that happens to also tie in nicely with practicing law in that area yeah. because, you know, I use that then to write contracts for people or to litigate for people or to help them enforce payment rights or deal with licensing issues or um, any of that sort of thing. So that's the that is the the goal for now is to try and do more of that writing so that it's out there so that it's available for contractors um, and then be available on the back end to help them when there's actually a problem that they need resolved. Yeah, I love that. Jason Lambert for the contractors. (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't help myself. Appreciate it. So uh, how do, how do people get it? If somebody saw this in their contract and they're like, man, I want to talk, talk to this guy about being my attorney. How, how do they submit an inquiry or, or get best way to find me is go to hammer and gavel.com. It's hammer the letter in gavel.com. Everything I write is there. It's got all my contact information. Um, My, the law firm website is hwhlaw.com. So you can find me there too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, either one yeah. of those great ways to reach me. And I, I really appreciate you having me here. Today. Yeah, man. Yeah. This has been a blast. I, I hope, uh, I hope this is communicated that construction law can be simply understood. Cause I don't think anything we talked about here was that complicated. No. Um, and, and you can get it right and you can be, uh, you know, causative over it and have it not be like a plague to your entire life. And you can just enjoy running your business. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's always, it's usually one step more complicated than what you remember from when you took your licensing class but yeah. definitely less complicated than you think it is. Yeah, awesome. So. Jason, thank you, man. Really hey, appreciate being thank here. you. I really appreciate it. Sweet.